Although prominent in music pedagogy for young learners, questions of how music curricula feel have had less application to post-secondary education. The theory I offer here concerns the effective politics of musicology and its contextualization. Affect theories after Brian Masumi tend to treat affect as prior to cognition. Masumi offers the famous example of Ronald Reagan rallying supporters with widely diverging opinions and attitudes, but who felt attracted to Reaganism in spite of their different ideals. Masumi argues that Reagan accomplished such a feat more through the charisma of his voice than with any cognitive activity his rhetoric may have stimulated. An essentially effective impulse received a variety of cognitive justifications among different political factions as they became allied. In After Adorno, Rethinking Music Sociology, Tia Donora considers music as akin to a psychoactive substance, offering listeners and players, in effect music users, a method of manipulating their own feelings. I'd like here to take the insights of the affective turn in a reflexive direction, toward a discussion of the affects that surround our practices of devising and receiving musicological programs. Where, in historical studies, the history of affect has been a topic of interest in recent years, this work fits into a hypothetical historiography of affect. Whether or not you agree with the further-fetched idea that affect proceeds or is separate from other kinds of cognition, it is not a stretch to say that how we feel about what has happened is as important in the present moment as what has actually happened. Affective impressions may stick in the memory even when the details of analytic conclusions and arguments do not. And even when our memories of analyses are eidetic, those memories are conditioned and contextualized by affects that give them stakes and meaning in the form of, say, enjoyment, or distaste, or, most pertinently here, nostalgia. Nostalgia, that most multivalently charged of the last half-decade's political topics, a sentiment which many posh composers and uncouth reactionaries share, albeit directed toward different objects. Nostalgia is, to many theorists, a longing for something one ascribes to the past. Memories of youth, the contemplation of an idealized great America, the feeling that all the greatest music has already been made, these are notions drenched in nostalgia. The specific flavor of nostalgia I will deal with here is hauntology. Hauntology is a term Jacques Derrida came up with and Mark Fisher revamped. In Fisher's use, it refers to the specter of a lost future, a longing for a virtuality which will not be realized. As Fisher wrote in What is Hauntology? From the end of World War II up until the 1990s, electronic music whether produced by high-culture composers such as Pierre Schaeffer or Karl-Heinz Stockhausen, or by synth-pop groups and dance music producers, has been synonymous with a sense of the future, so much so that film and television would habitually turn to electronic music when it wanted to invoke the future. But by 2005, electronica was no longer capable of evoking a future that felt strange or dissonant. If electronic music was futuristic, it was in the same sense that fonts are gothic. The future now connoted a settled set of concepts, affects, and associations. 21st century electronic music had failed to progress beyond what had been recorded in the 20th century. Practically, anything produced in the 2000s could have been recorded in the 1990s. Electronic music had succumbed to its own inertia and retrospection. It was also clear that this was more than a moment in a familiar pattern, in which, as one genre wanes, another emerges to take its place at the leading edge of innovation. There was no leading edge of innovation anymore. In music, as elsewhere in culture, we were living, in Franco Berardi's suggestive phrase, after the future. Let there be no mistake. This is a pessimistic worldview. For Fisher, as for so many Marxist and post-Marxist theorists, there looms over his narrative the specter of an all-consuming antagonist, capitalism, and especially the biggest, baddest capitalism, late capitalism, which saps the authenticity, not to say cultural capital, out of literally everything imaginable. That's it, I suppose. The postmodern apocalypse is here. Music has succumbed. What music we get now is the arbitrary whimsy of the shattered pieces of grander narratives. 
among which the dominant force is now merely what Nick Land referred to as the senseless babble of fashion. Just kidding. I have a different, more positional theory of ontology, not of what it is, but of why it is, what it signals to us, and what cognitive exercises its profound and indeed often pleasurably nostalgic affects can be directed toward by today's students. In the late 1990s, Mark Fisher and Nick Land worked at the same lab, Warwick University's Cybernetic Culture Research Unit, the CCRU. The C-Crew? Nah. The CCRU is something of an academic legend, likely because it shared two characteristics with the most legendary of rock stars. It was short-lived, and it took an interest in its own multimedia aesthetic. The CCRU was, in a sense, descended from another legend, Birmingham University's Center for Contemporary Culture Studies, or CCCS, known for its work on subcultures, including UK rave culture, which latter interest the CCRU also adopted. Theorist Sadie Plant completed her PhD at the former in 1989 and co-founded the latter in 1995, alongside who would become the CCRU's most famous export, Nick Land. Land and the CCRU developed drastic philosophies for a desperate world. Their best-known concepts are hyperstition, the capacity of ideas to function like viral self-fulfilling prophecies, infecting systems in the process of becoming actualized, and accelerationism, an idea that the far right has introduced to the mainstream as a kind of longing for a great, destructive revolution from which new and better systems may arise. That's an oversimplified reading, of course. There are many variations of accelerationism. As a whole, the writings of the CCRU, whether leaning toward the political right or left, are filled with dense references and dark metaphors, motivated by a sense that something is being lost, and has been lost, through the progress of contemporary society. In Land's current far-right opinionating, he seems to be advocating for a kind of return to feudalism. Fisher, on the other hand, wrote of the ongoing loss of a better future. For him, ontological music was a lament for the self-overcoming that had been characteristic of a social democratic culture. He found that lament especially prevalent in Britain. Most, but by no means all, of the artists who have been described as ontological are British. The yearnings detectable in much ontological music were no doubt stirred up by the expectations raised by a public service broadcasting system and a popular culture that could be challenging and experimental. And here, I think Fisher both makes a mistake and hits on something important. Why would ontology seem especially British? Is it really that British culture had previously been so experimental, propelled forth by the power of the BBC? I'm being a little bit uncharitable there, and we could debate the specifics of Fisher's theory of Britain's past promising future. But there is a key term missing from Fisher's critical lexicon, one which might supplement his rather incomplete-seeming explanation of ontology's origins. The term is colonialism. The Paris Exposition of 1889 is something of its own legend in musicology. As it was first taught to me, this was the time and place that Debussy encountered the sounds of the gamelan, whose influence could then be heard in his piano work Pagod. And that, for me, as a secondary and undergraduate student, was where the discussion of gamelan's influence ended, as though gamelan as an entire art form had been encapsulated, if imperfectly, in Debussy's vignette. Of course, had that discussion occurred in an ethnomusicology course, it might have segued into an overview of the many good studies which have analyzed and continue to analyze the musics of one or another colonized culture. The Museum of Ethnomusicology is not short of exhibits. But to me, there is an elephant in this highly decorated room, and that is the question of the influence of so-called world music on so-called Western music. How much do the rhythms and harmonic structures of American minimalism, a classic example here is Terry Riley's In C, as well as their post-minimalist echoes through the likes of Steve Reich and Philip Glass and on into the Western popular cinematic oral imaginary, owe to the eastward pilgrimages of North American composers through the 50s, 60s, and 70s. How indebted are the soaring guitar solos of John Lennon, Jimi Hendrix, or Jimmy Page to Ravi Shankar and what he called the Great Sitar Explosion? But then, even the guitar itself seems to come out of nowhere for a Eurocentric music history that treats the Arab oud 
as an outside curiosity rather than a foundational technology. In contrast, Western music curricula do a much better job of attuning students' ears to the history of vocal counterpoint and its formalization by the church and mechanization into the idiom of the well-tuned keyboard. There is nevertheless an important lacuna here, too, when we omit to discuss Byzantine chant, audible as a stylistic bridge between plain chant and the sounds of the Arab world. Eurocentric musicology, as a whole, has done a poor job of elucidating the many roots of the so-called West which lie in the so-called East. I propose that the most intensified period of Western music's drawing upon Eastern influences has been the 20th century, understood as a time of simultaneous de-ephemeralization through recording technologies and, relatedly, globalism. When I say 20th century here, I mean a historical period rather than a range of numbers. I think the musical 20th century began with the Paris Exposition of 1889 and ended, like so many things, with the events of fall 2001. Of course, historical periodization is an art, not a science, so I will make a case for the mnemonic value of this particular idea of what we might call the long musical 20th century. The shared theme of music from 1889 to 2001, when taught from the perspective of any school with a Eurocentric history, is appropriation. Appropriation was Stravinsky's solution to the crisis of tonality, and a formalist reaction against it was Schoenberg's. Through appropriation, minimalism acquired its post-tonal, slow-moving harmonic palettes, and music concrete, spectralism, and post-spectralism sought more and more microscopic ways of mining the values of found sounds. For a while, pop music drew upon a buffet of the global other even while that other was less and less distant. It was only through the deniability of the exotic, as opposed to domestic, influence that entire new genres seemed to come out of the cultural ether, out of the singular genius of rock stars or great composers. Like any great extractive process, though, the global infusion of Western music could not continue in the same manner forever, and from late colonialism we get the origins of hauntology. I pitched this talk as using hauntology as an instrument for historical periodization, and my introduction suggested I would do all that in a way that operationalized affect as well as matters of fact. It has now come time for me to earn my abstract. Hauntology is a piece in the process of cultural appropriation that has accompanied global colonialism. It is what happens when the reserves of the so-called exotic are depleted, which is to say de-exoticized. The same acquisitive drives that saw artists appropriate their global others eventually turns inward, producing what Frederick Jameson lamented as postmodern pastiche, Simon Reynolds dubbed retromania, and Mark Fisher explored with perhaps a little bit more sympathy as hauntology. The inward-looking spiral of appropriation does not necessarily have an end state. We may continue indefinitely to be haunted and accompanied by the lost virtualities of a future that some subconscious believes still had more to give. It is no accident that today's hauntological cinema looks so often toward the stars through the lens of space opera, or past some cataclysm that has re-enchanted the world with the feeling of foreign danger, and in particular with vast tracts of the unknown. But these, to borrow the phraseology of Sylvan Tompkins, are merely sedative scripts masking the post-colonial trauma at whose conclusions colonial apparatuses must eventually come to live with themselves. When there are no more stars to explore, introspection is necessary. Hauntology, in the radical conclusion of an appropriative logic which has begun to appropriate itself, we find not the other stretched out before our gaze, but rather the uncomfortable feeling of the self overly scrutinized and picked apart. Those who earnestly channel Jameson's derision about pastiche should be reminded that there is nothing Eurocentric discourse does to itself which it has not already done to its others. Despite its many branches, from right accelerationism to left accelerationism to gender accelerationism, accelerationism has not developed any post-colonial branch. 
The simple reason is that accelerationism's supposed crises, as much as its supposed offerings, are the product of a colonial framework. The end of the empire on which the sun never sets is not actually the end of the world. Further, the cybernetic theories developed in the CCRU are fundamentally the perspectives of observers. Cybernetics uses control flow metaphors, borrowed from computer programming. Metaphors of feedback and feedforward loops of input and output. The most radically post-human of the CCRU's philosophies not only drew little distinction between humans and computers, but also implicitly erased the distinction between the observer and the observed, as though it were enough to simply understand and accept that we are all part of a cybernetic system. That is not enough. We need to consider what it feels like to be a component of a process. Not necessarily for the sake of developing such heretical experiences as empathy, but to recognize what part of the system we are participating in. So what can we do with the feeling that comes upon us or our students that the greatest music has already been made? We can say that the feeling of the conclusion of a process of appropriation is not conclusion, but rather appropriation turned on itself. Nostalgia is the practice of fetishism turned toward objects that actually deserve it. Now I've gone on for 15 minutes theorizing about a phenomenon which some have said accompanies certain music, and I've posited why we can use this phenomenon to inform a periodization encapsulating the music of the 20th century as separate from that of the 21st. But I've done very little to show how specific musical features or pieces are hauntological. That task might prove very interesting due to the possibility of uncovering the hauntologies of cultures past. Might we find, say, certain troubadour songs to exemplify a certain sense of time as manifested in an attitude to the past, an attitude to the future, and a contemplation of that which was not, but which seemed promised by that which was?